Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for attending today. This is our Tillman School of Business adjunct training session. Uh, this is one of the first time we've tried to do this via Zoom. So as, as we're learning how to do this, this you know, from the standpoint of providing this content via Zoom, I've got the chat function open, so I'll be monitoring the chat function. And if you have a question as we go through the content, please don't hesitate to ask. And with that, if we could just uh, very briefly, if everyone would introduce themselves, I'll go first since I'm, since I'm already here. I'm, I'm Dr. Doug Ward. I'm the department chair for operations and non-traditional studies and been a full-time faculty member since 2014. Uh, okay, I'm Dave Hill, chair of uh, management and human resources uh, been at uh, UMO since uh, 2002. I'm Kathy Best, I'm the Dean of the Tillman School of Business. I'm Norm Crumpacker, Chair of Business Analytics and Computer Information Systems. I am Malika Pang, Economist with the New Mexico Department of Transportation. Jonathan Rundle. We can't hear you, Jonathan, or at least I can't. Jonathan, I can't hear you either. So while he's fixing his mic, I'm Jeff Bowles, Department Chair for Healthcare Management. Jonathan, you may have to go, um, just so you know, you may have to go down, uh, back down to the settings for the, uh, for the talking next to your mute microphone in the lower left-hand corner and um, go back up to your select the microphone and, and do that. And if that doesn't work, try logging out and then logging back in. And then when it comes up, if you want to use computer audio, click yes. So that's just, uh, those are the fixes for Zoom real quickly. While he's doing that, Miss Peggy? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm having trouble getting the uh, video going. I'm at home and I have a new laptop, but I can hear everybody and I can see you. Okay, now, as Dr. Bowles was saying, down the, in the uh, bottom of your screen, there should be a camera icon near the left. You just want to make sure that that camera icon doesn't have a, a line through it. It doesn't, and I've got a stop video. Um, it's like I said, it's a new Lenovo. I use this all the time at work. Okay. It, it's got the easy camera. It looks like everything's set, but as long as I can hear you, I'm good. Okay, Miss Peggy, uh, what do you do? Oh, okay. I am um, department chair of the uh, our non-traditional and traditional. Uh, business department at Avery University, and I've been at Avery 31 years, and I teach accounting. Understand. Thank you, Henry. Henry Singletary, uh, assistant professor of accounting, chair of accounting and finance at UMO. Thank you, Miss Carly. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Carter, can you introduce yourself? Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, my name is Carly. I am currently actually working in the healthcare industry, um, but also then adjuncting with UMO um, since I have left UMO um, earlier this year. Um, as a, I would used to be a senior advisor with UMO. Thank you. And Jonathan Rundle, did you ever get yours to work? Uh, he must have logged out, must have been logged back in. Okay, while he's doing that, uh, again, thank you so much for attending this session today. And the, we're going to kind of follow the agenda and see where we end up. First part of the agenda will be some, Dr. Bess has some information for us. Then we'll have a, a review of Starfish by 
Dr. Crumpacker. Then we'll get into some other general discussions with reference to UMO policy. Some of you have talked for us before. Some of you, it's been a while, and some of you will be the first time. So we just want to cover some information that has changed since the uh, last time or for the first time for us. And with that, uh, until Dr. Roman comes back, uh, Dr. Best. Part of this meeting. Uh, we appreciate your willingness to serve uh, University of Mount Olive as well and our students. Um, just reporting out on a few of the um, changes that have occurred. Um, the one that you've already familiar with is that we're moving to the eight week format uh, for our non-traditional programming. That means uh, for both online courses as well as any evening courses, the format will be eight weeks. We will have no longer five week classes as of summer 2019. Um, there's been conversation about, you know, the transition plan there may be some hybrid classes initially in summer. There may be some uh, seated classes for the more difficult quantitative type classes that students are usually challenged by, but we do not know that with any sense of exactness. Um, the, best, the best thing at this point, I think, is for everyone to plan for eight week online classes. That's what we are doing as faculty and uh, as leadership here in the business school. We're um, coordinating the, this reformatting of classes uh, in the Moodle shells so that uh, they'll be online classes, be taught from a virtual perspective. Um, this is an initiative of our new president, Dr. David Poole. Um, so we are still receiving information about the specifics of all of this. We have eight week syllabi in hand, uh, designed by the subject matter experts for each course. And um, they are also in the process of beginning work on Moodle shell development for the eight week classes. They, the Moodle shells are up do in their final final form March, mid-March of this year. Um, or at least due for their first round of review in mid-March. Um, as for expectations for online faculty, um, those expectations are being uh, revamped, uh, reworked, as we see what the mop, the model of eight week online classes is. Um, it will definitely be more interactive, a model that's more interactive with students, um, more FaceTime through Zoom, um, more actual office hours, um, just more one-on-one -on -one interaction more from you'll be presenting your classes more from a teaching perspective rather than a facilitator's um any questions from you all that are attending on the eight week format in terms of the locations let me just comment someone asked this morning if they would be closing locations um I can't answer that. Uh, they definitely are being reorganized uh, using less, less office space, uh, revision of um, hours, um, 10 to seven, I think is their new um, day at the locations. Um, more of a one-stop shop um, in terms of advising, financial aid, and other services that are provided at each um, off-campus site. So any questions on the, the change in format?
I need, I was muted. Then guess this is Peggy Wright. I, I don't have a problem. I was just wondering if there was any reasoning behind going to the eight weeks. We've just moved to six weeks in our MBA. Uh, but we've also just moved to a uh, standard semester. We were at an all over the place since 1988. So we've moved to it and it's, uh, there's so much competition out there. Sometimes it's really hard to know what to do. Right. Uh, but I was just wondering if there was any reason behind the eight week versus the seven week. Um, I think one is quality, being able to, you know, more time for students to digest the material. Um, two is the fact that rather than having three five week sessions, um, a two eight week um, sessions within a semester will allow the students to take four classes so they'll take they can take two classes each eight-week term yeah I actually recommended that for ours the the quantitative courses that we used to have until last fall were actually ten weeks because we had the prereqs built into it but I like the two eight weeks and then two eight weeks also I think that does give them a lot better time for particularly accounting, mm -hmm. and statistics, and finance, and economics. Well, we have uh, tried some classes that are 10 weeks, especially the more difficult ones that have numbers. But um, we, the reason why we chose 10 weeks was that we had to choose a multiple of five. So mm -hmm. the classes had to be five week, 10 week, or 15 week for undergraduates. Mm -hmm. So I think Another reason is standardization across the board. Um, all of the classes, including the MBA classes, will be either fit, you know, regular traditional daytime classes, the last entire semester, or there'll be an eight-week class. I think that's a good idea. Any other questions about that or comments? Um, the other the other topic that I wanted to make you aware of and address is that the business school this is our year of self-study um, with ACBSP ACBSP the credits business programs um, so we have been uh, going through a pretty thorough um, assessment for the last three years 2015 through 18 um, so if you are teaching a class that has either a Peregrine exam or a, an inbound or outbound more properly, inbound or outbound assessment exam, be sure to follow the syllabi um, very closely and make sure that all your students take the exam. If you have any questions about the grading or the any any mechanics that involve that that uh, assessment exam, please ask me um, or or one of the department chairs. In addition, we have assignments labeled throughout the curriculum as assessment assignments. So be certain that if you see in a syllabus in each major, there are five courses that have assessment assignments contained within them. And if you are teaching a class with an assessment assignment, it's essential that you set up a Dropbox or a somewhere in your Moodle shell, if not a Dropbox, you set up some way for your students to, so that we can locate that assignment, um, whether it's within the assignment or outside of the assignment. Um, because we need, we'll be downloading all those assessment assignments. So that is not an option to skip. The assessment or assignments are a required part of every class. Um, but you, just read their syllabus it's because they're noted in red or they're bolded, or they're signified which assignments are assessment assignments. So all of that's a part of accreditation. We'll have uh, our we have a mid-year report that's due February 2nd, and we have uh, our final report is due in November. So um, we're working on strategic plan. 
And after that, we'll be collecting survey information uh, from various surveys, graduate surveys, advising surveys, employer surveys um, that have been done. And in addition to uh, building new um, degree programs um, or repackaging new programs for marketing in the summer. So all of that is pretty kind of a short summation of what's going on in the business school. That not to mention the all of the traditional activities that go on for 18 to 21 year olds. Henry Singletary is working with the VITA program this spring, uh, volunteer income tax assistance program where students help him to um, do tax returns for certain income uh, levels uh, of individual tax returns. Um, let's see, um, Deborah Houston with the assistance of Doug Ward is working on a career panel. We've got Dean's lunches and focus groups and uh, Jeff Bowles has worked with internships and um, so um, and internship fairs. Just we're trying to build a position for to to manage internship and advising in the business school. So lots going on. Any questions? Could I expand upon that sure. assessment assignment just a little bit? So let me share my screen and whenever I'm done, if no one has a question, we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Crumpack to talk about starfish. But what, I, what we're talking about here is this, as when I'm signed into Moodle, hopefully you can see my screen. It's a Moodle screen. Uh, I have signed into Moodle just like you would. And whenever you sign into Moodle, it's going to call up your course pages. And under your course pages is where you are going to find our syllabuses under faculty resources. And if you go here, once you get assigned a course and you don't have access, please let us know and we'll make sure you get access to it. But I'm gonna to go to a syllabi that Dr. Best was talking about with reference to that had that assessment assignment in it so that you can see what it looks like. And uh, we also are doing something very similar in our MBA program as we're moving forward with that one. We do not have the uh, courses or the assignment selected yet, but we're heading in that direction. So more to come. But in our assessment, we have two components of our assessment. We have the external, internal, and external assessments that we do with Peregrine. The MIS 300 course that every student takes will have the inbound exam. I'm not aware of any one of you who will be teaching MIS 300, uh, but some of these other courses you may get involved in at the undergraduate level in our accounting, banking, finance, healthcare, human resources, analytics, management, and uh, CIS also has an outbound paradigm that we have that. And whenever you see this, we wanna make sure that the you have that embedded into your course syllabi and make sure that the students take that because that's, that's gonna be a graded component. And depending on how well they score on that particular assessment will determine what grade they will earn for their efforts. But what Dr. Bess was talking about was the assessment, of that, that's the Perian assignment. So let me go find an internal assessment so that you can see what that looks like and how we can, how we're going to embed that also into our course shell and show you that real quickly. Let me see if this one has, yes. So this is our business 483. This is that internal assessment. This is where Dr. Best was saying that you're going to create a drop box. So I'm going to show you what that looks like here momentarily. But what we have said is that for this particular course, the business 483, this industry research that the students are going to do, this is that assessment assignment that we want to be flagged in Moodle shell. That does not mean that you should do anything different as far as trying to teach them to get a better score on that assessment assignment. 
You just need to, to do your due diligence and do what you would normally do in any class. It is more of a administrative placeholder so that when we get ready to come back and go pull that assessment assignment or that artifact, we'll know exactly where it's at, what course, and where you have it embedded into your Moodle shell. That's all that really means. So you don't need to do anything extraordinary or separate or um, have, teach the students to do anything different. That was not the intent of that. So that's the course syllabi. That's the assessment assignment that must be uploaded into Moodle shell. And what Dr. Best was saying is to create a drop box. And that drop box, really, what that really entails is it's nothing more than the assignment uh, place that you're going to be having already developed for that assignment in your Moodle shell. And it could be you're using Turnitin as the location to store that, or it could be just a regular assignment. But all we want you to do is, I'm, this is my course shell, and I'm going down to my first writing assignment for this one. And if this was the Business 483, and this was my writing assignment, that I was going to use to create that drop box. And basically all I would do is I would probably come in here and do something like this. Or I would embed it here in my content and then display it on my course page because this one's got some instructions. This is probably not the most ideal way to do it, but this is a way. And really what, when she said the drop box, this is really what it is. It's the same location that you would use for any assignment that you have in your course, but it's just flagged in such a way where when we come back, get ready to pull the assignment, we know exactly where we need to go get it. That, that's, really all, that's really all she was talking about. Any questions on that before I turn it over to Dr. Crumpacker? Can we have those drop boxes automatically loaded on the template Moodle shell for the, those courses? Uh, you probably could if we engage Joyce Dobbinshire and let her know specifically which courses in what format and which assignments. And in some of these, um, because they, they were such a diversity in the assignments, some of those in the syllabus, especially in the uh, HRM category, we had to end up saying that uh, it would be at the discretion at the course professor, depending on which assignment they choose to use. But the concept will be the same. We just wanted to identify. Any other questions? Okay, with that, Dr. Crumpacker. Okay. So Starfish, can, can you see my screen, Doug? Um, I see you, you need to share. Can you see it now? I uh, see your screen being shared, yes sir. Okay, awesome, thank you. So what is uh, Starfish? Or where do we find it in, um, in at UMO? Go to the UMO homepage. My UMO, and everybody has access to a starfish that's um, on the left hand side. If you're currently teaching a course for UMO, you have access to starfish, and it's right here. Uh, same credentials to log in as you would to my UMO. And Starfish is basically a, um, a one-stop shop for every UMO record for all of our UMO students. So everything um, that we might want to have access to with regards to our scholars may be uh, identified and found uh, in Starfish. 
including Moodle. Uh, when you take attendance in Moodle, uh, that is some way, form, or fashion can be captured in Starfish. Your grades in your Moodle gradebook are used to populate certain fields in Starfish. So we'll start here. And this little drop down gives you more options. One thing we love for all instructors to do is to create an institutional profile or their institutional profile. And I just clicked on that and hopefully it's coming up. So here you can um, put your title, put in your phone number for your office. You can put in your cell number if you wish. Not necessarily encouraged, but that's an option. Alternative email, etc. So if you want to create an uh, institutional profile for yourself uh, on Starfish, which will be seen by everybody, including uh, your general overview, your biography, all that good stuff. Um, note that students will be able to, and they already are, trying to schedule appointments via Starfish. And you can specify what your appointment preferences are on Starfish. The minimum amount of time for each appointment, 15 minutes, schedule a deadline, What's the latest time you'll have an appointment or none, et cetera. Realize you can't hurt anything by coming in here and fiddling around. And so um, please do and set it up. If you have any questions, you can contact me or uh, Dr. Delight Yokely is the other point of contact. And you can include where your office hour is or office is. Then your email notifications. That'll be sent from Starfish. How frequently do you want reminders to be sent to you that you have an appointment at a designated time? So I've chosen to select one email with all of my appointments and it'll be sent to me at nine o'clock in the morning. Any planning reminders? Any questions regarding the overall profile? Well, you can always come back home. Let's see, we looked at institutional profile, appointment preferences, um, email notifications. Now let's go to students. This is perhaps where most faculty will live. Let me give you an overview of this screen. So my students, right now you see all of my students and all of my classes. Uh, term is 2019 spring, and it's all of my students in every one of my classes. If, however, I want to zero in on a specific class, um, let's look at the uh, connection of the relationships. Since I'm the instructor of each of these classes, I can click on say data preparation and analysis with SAS. And these are my nine students enrolled in the course. If you click on any one student, you can get additional information about that student, what their academic standing is, their cumulative GPA, whether they're an international student or not. Uh, you can drill down even further, get specific info. And you can do this for each and every one of your students. A success plan is inactive right now. 
they're soon to be um, combined or soon to be made active as soon as our curriculum evaluation sheets are available. These are the courses that are associated with me and the student. Student tracking, whether or not I, I have any meetings with this student or that student has meetings with anybody else. Notes that have been made about that student and the student's network. Uh, the network that a student is, uh, their network is assigned at an administrative level. That is who are all the people that that student should be associated with. Click on, click on flags. If you have an issue with the student or a concern, you can uh, click on the student and then choose one of the available flags an attendance concern, behavioral concern, whether or not the care team should be alerted, also known as our early alert system. And when you click on, uh, we'll take a look at the other ones. Some of the other ones are general concern, and danger of failing, missing assignments, no-show. You can type a note. Um, let's take a look at the bottom here, what we say. Um, the student cannot view this item. So whenever you select something as a flag, uh, it'll let you know whether or not the student can or cannot, cannot view this item and everybody else who will be able to see the item. So in this case, the, um, the athletic coaches would be able to see it. Uh, academic leadership, academic support. And the note that you type here, um, it'll be permanent, a permanent record. So be, um, be cognizant of that. Be nice. Don't use any derogatory language, for example. Note too that um, anything we put here is FERPA protected meaning the student, even though it says here that they cannot view this item through normal Starfish channels, at the end of the day, if they wanna see what's been written about them, they can see what's been written about them in this comment field. So even though they can't see it through Starfish, they can see it if they so choose. And as if I were to hit save, then that would be, this would be saved and disseminated to each of these groups here. Or if I click on never mind, that's a fancy way to say cancel. Um, in addition to flags that can be raised, something that's really nice and the students eat up are um, kudos. So uh, kudos is way to go. So I want to say to this student, outstanding academic performance and this particular student is in this class of mine a great and you type a note great work on the final on the midterm And so the student can view this and it will go to, also their advisor will see this note, student services will see this, and their academic coaches will see this note. So in addition to any flags that you might want to raise, anytime a student does good, exceptionally well, then give them kudos. So we have flags and we have kudos um, messages. And you can type a message to the student. This is basically an internal email to the student. And I could send myself a copy.
Well, the reason UMO went to Starfish, as does a lot of um, institutions of higher learning, is based on research, the retention rate for institutions that effectively use Starfish is increased by 5 to 7%. So of every 100 students that would have otherwise not remain with the university from one semester to the next, we can retain five to seven of them. And if you have an appointment with a student, there's an appointment option. Schedule appointment, date, time, location. By the way, students use this. Um, they're aware of it. They're tinkering with it. Um, they'll make a meeting uh, arrangements uh, using Starfish. So log in to Starfish. And finally, you can create a note. This is just a little note. It's not a message. It's, it's, it's a permanent something that's tied to, kind of like a sticky note, that's tied to the student's record. But it's not emailed to anybody, or can be. You can email yourself or the student. But it um, doesn't necessarily have to be, unlike a message, which will definitely be sent to the student. So, uh, any questions related to Starfish? Gave me 20 minutes. We had an hour this morning between um, Dr. Yokley and myself to share with some folks. We have 20 minutes here. I just clicked on tracking. I don't have anything to track so far. But if you take a look at all the notes that have been assigned, uh, no, No flags, everything's saying, hey, you're doing a great job. Uh, and the reason I get these is either I've sent them or another professor has sent something, whether it be a flag or a kudos, and I am that student's primary advisor. So it's a way to uh, track students. It's a way to raise alerts when students aren't doing what we believe they should be doing in order to succeed be successful in college, and it activates a team of individuals who have the student's best interest at heart so that we can take action, reach out to the student, contact the student, get them the assistance that they need so that they can graduate from the University of Mount Olive with their degree in hand. So what I encourage you to do is to log into Starfish, fill around with it. You can't break anything, and um, if you have any questions, let me know. Dr. Cronbeck. Could we also discuss uh, probably for the online adjuncts, they won't, they will not, they are not going to be assigned a advising role for students. However, uh, as we're moving more to an online format, we even have some NBA student athletes, and any student athlete will require to do a, a feedback form that our uh, student athlete coordinator here on at campus will send us and they will use Starfish to do that. Could you kind of discuss that a little bit? That may be uh, one of the things that our adjuncts will have to fill out with some of these student athletes. Okay. Um, when you get a, if you have a student athlete in your class, you will get an email from, I believe it's Brenda Cates she is the representative, our NCA faculty representative. Uh, that email will basically state that you have a student athlete in a course that you're scheduled to teach and that you need to come to Starfish and fill out a student athlete form. Um, basically, it uh, substantiates that the student athlete is doing okay in your class and if not, we can initiate a student intervention um, sooner rather than later. Keep in mind that email is for the entirety of a semester. So let's say you're teaching in session E, uh, which is the second part of an MBA program or seven week session. Uh, if you get that email at the beginning of the semester, say in January or February, then it may very well be possible that the email is in reference to a uh, student athlete that is currently enrolled in your class that's going to be offered in session E for the upcoming session that begins in mid-March. Did that answer your question, um, Doug? 
Yes, uh, so, yes, yes. And, and what you do is you get that flag, and it'll it'd be a very, um, it'll be just some blocks you have to fill out to really discuss where you think, how well you think that student is doing academically, because our student athletes have specific criteria they have to meet. And again, as Dr. Crumpacker said, it, uh, it's a tool that which you can use to in, to launch off getting some assistance because that student is a student athlete has eligibility requirements they have to meet academically as well. And that usually will come through Starfish. And it usually will come somewhere in the semester, depending on uh, what class you're teaching, where you do an initial and somewhere you will do a follow-up assessment as well. But I, I, the reason why I wanted to make sure you understood that because I just, even in the MBA course, I had a fifth year senior student athlete in the MBA class that I had, that I had the opportunity to uh, discuss his academic performance uh, two times during that eight week, that seven week process. So I just wanna make sure that you were aware of that. Uh, anything else for uh, Dr. Crumpacker on Starfish? Yeah, please, please, please uh, log in and tinker with it, fill around. Um, if you have any concerns you need to raise about a student, here's the place to do it. Just just one quick comment or question, Peggy Wright again. They will notify us if we have a student athlete, is that correct? In the MBA? Yes, you'll be notified that your class that you're teaching has at least one student athlete in it. Okay. That's when you go to Starfish and provide feedback with regards to that student athlete, or that's okay. at least that one student athlete. Okay. Uh, and and Miss Peggy, you you when you when your course shell becomes available and you open it up, you, there's no way uh, to look at the course shell and say, "Hey, this is a student athlete." Uh, the only reason you're gonna know it's a student athlete is if you get something through starfish that you need to do this form or if you go into self-service and look look at your students to try to gain an understanding of some of their backgrounds or if you ask that student in the beginning okay i've already got my course show class starts monday and i've been in looking at it and uh going through each one of the students already and uh, i haven't seen anything but will it come in an email or do i have to go into starfish to make sure whether there's a student athlete in there Typically, you will get an email from Dr. Cates that you uh, have got, you'll be looking on the lookout for something coming in Starfish for uh, that particular, well, I don't think it, it is an email that says specifically who the student is as much as it is an email to say that uh, you'll be getting this form via Starfish on a student athlete and, and in that particular um, when you go into Starfish, it'll be very apparent who they're talking about. Okay. And if you wanted to check beforehand, if you came to Starfish, looked under students, clicked on all my students, and then came over here to cohort. Cohort is a group of uh, students in a similar uh, category. And I scroll down and I can say, okay, baseball. I can highlight some of these. Uh, I wanted to do all of the athletic teams. And let's go ahead and finish it out. So let me see how many student athletes I have right now. And that, I, that's a good point that you could use the filters to help identify those as well. Yeah, I can apply filters and it might work a little bit. Okay, that, that helps to know. And, and if we could uh, rest here just for a moment and talk about some policy when it comes to student athletes, even in the NBA program or even in the online environment. Uh, athletics is in the, uh, something that the university endorses. Typically, the student athletes, their, their games are throughout the entire week. And there's a lot of them over the weekend. Some of these students may be traveling out of town and just not having access to the internet. And I know that that is, that is a hard at times to say in today's environment, that you can't get access to the internet. Uh, in some cases, yes, that, that is true. Uh, however, you know, accountability is where that student 
and you are having those conversations that you understand that if they are a student athlete, are they in season and um, when would they be unavailable to get those assignments in? And, and please work with that student to ensure that that student gets those assignments in. They don't get a free pass not to turn the assignment in. They got still got to turn the assignment in. But you may have to make some adjustments around that particular student um, if that student say, has an away game and they just just will not be um, be able to get that in. I, I encourage the students to get it in early rather than late, uh, but I also encourage them to uh, reach out to me to let me know if they are going to be out of town so that we can make adjustments. Because again, athletics is something that the university endorses and it is uh, something that our students uh, do and we want to uh, be about supporting students while making sure again that they're held accountable for their sons. Any questions on that? Now my filter has been applied for all student and all cohorts of all teams that were previously selected. So in all of my classes I have a total of four student athletes and they're listed over here. That's all I have to share um, and, and the amount of time for um, Starfish. Okay, if you would unshare your screen. And moving forward, it, as you uh, get into Starfish, if you have any questions whatsoever, or if anything is unclear, please, please reach out to us and we'll be, we'll be glad to, us being the department chairs, we'll, we'll be happy to provide any assistance that we possibly can. So we're gonna go into the next topic that's kind of a, a, a hodgepodge of information. Some of it may be redundant for some of you who have taught with us before. Some of it may be new. So I'm going to uh, kick it off, talk about some of the UMO policy. And anyone has a question or any of the other department chairs, please weigh in. Uh, one of those UMO policies is this, when you go to your Moodle shell and you sign in, you come to your course page, and you, again, you have down here under uh, faculty resources, TSB faculty resources, where you can find your syllabus for that particular course. And when you, what we request is that uh, when you get a Moodle shell, and uh, let's say two scenarios, first scenario being that um, you have talked with us before and you've already have a course shell developed and you say, I'm going to import from that old course shell. Please make sure you come here and get the latest edition of the syllabi because uh, we have seen where some um, faculty members will do that import and end up having an old syllabi. One of our policies is that our we have standard syllabi. We want you to use the syllabi that is standard, that's posted, and use it to develop your course shell uh, and present the material that you're going to offer for that particular course. Uh, your academic freedom does not uh, grant you the uh, autonomy to come here and change the syllabi without having some discussions with the department chair to understand why you're going to change it. Uh, every one of these syllabi look, kind of looks like in this format, it lists the textbook. And in some cases, if you don't have a textbook, you may have to uh, reach out to the publisher directly via their website and request that textbook per the ISBN. Uh, and I know you're familiar with doing that. And they may send us an email, especially if you're brand new, never talked with us before, to validate that you are who you say you are and then we'll grant that permission and you should be able to get it. I have all the textbooks that I order through the publisher and sent directly to my home. It just works better for me. But, but use the textbook that's listed, reach out to the, to the publisher to gain the, uh, whatever you need, certainly the textbook and or uh, access to their website. And whenever you set up your Moodle shell, we use a weighted grading system make sure that your Moodle shell is, is uh, developed in such a way where it mirrors what you see here in the syllabi. 
this is that part of that academic freedom that uh, you, before you come in and start changing all these weights and doing a lot of different things, you need to be engaging the department chair because we want to make sure that the content is going to be consistent across our offerings. As you can see in this particular one, I say at least five homework assignments. I may choose to have six, I may choose to have seven, and that's perfectly fine. That's well within your academic freedom. But of that seven or five or six or seven, 20% of the total grade is gonna be assigned to that. Same thing is true for the final paper. I may choose to do a team paper, I may choose to do an individual paper, I may call it a project, um, whatever the case may be, but it's gonna be weighted at 30%. Uh, we're not telling you to come back to the department chair and say, hey, I'm going to use, I see you use paper, I'm going to use a project. Uh, that, that's the academic freedom you have. But if you say, hey, I don't like 30%, I want it to be 50%, then come back to the department chair and let's have a discussion. Here in the weekly schedule is where you have some freedom. Uh, you may choose to say, hey, I, I want to cover chapters one two and then pull up chapter four in the week one and move chapter three down into week two that's well within your purview as well so you don't really need to come back to the department chair as long as you're clearly communicating that in your mood field and here the last page for all of our standard syllabi is some standard information for for you as well as the students Unless they have, they, you know, if they have a question, if they need academic support or, or they have some accommodation, some accommodation may mean that um, a student in an online environment needs to have, uh, who may be visually impaired, so to speak, and, and they, they need to have a recorded lecture where they hear your voice instead of seeing the content, because the content is hard for them to see. And if that, if you have a student like that, one of the first things you, we want you to ask is that, do you have, did you go to accessibility services and get a, a administrative document on file that documents what the, it is? You have an opportunity to review that document and agree and provide feedback to make those accommodations for that student. And it also talks about a university catalog here as well. So let's go look at, uh, one of the Moodle shells that I built for this particular class, and again, we see it's 20, I'm sorry, this is a five-week online format. Let me go to the 15-week format so you can see, when we go look at the Moodle shell, so you see how I did the grade book. Because we want to make sure that the grade book is absolutely accurate, because it's the grade book where it's weighted, where the students is going to be receiving um, their feedback. This is the 15 week format, same format, a little bit different here in the grading scheme where I have at least five homework, at least five quizzes, and a final paper. So it's 20, 50, 30 for this particular course. So when you go to my course shell for this, um, for this particular course, again, part of this big policy discussion, Whenever I go out and build out my course shell, when I look at my grade book, and I want to go to uh, grade book setup as part of the initial build out of this course, you see that I have at least six homework assignments, and it's under the category of homework, and it's weighted at 20%, and it's a simple weighted means which means that each one of these assignments carries the same weight, six divided into 20, a little bit less than 3.6 or 3.7% for each one of these assignments. I've got six quizzes, and the total of the quizzes for the total course grade is 50%, but each one of these quizzes, simple weighting means, meaning that each one weighs the same, uh, a part of that 50%. In the final paper being 30% with a weighted mean of 100%. And what this really does is that if you don't set it up where it has the weights in it and you just use the average, then you're not, you really don't have a weighted grade book. And we tell the students that they're going to have a weighted grade book where uh, you, and as you know, if you, if you sit down and do the math, 
uh, each one of these components and you just do a weighted, uh, just do an average, that that tends to kind of inflate the grade more so than applying the specific weights against the category that you have established. Any questions? Yeah, two comments on that. Uh, one, these grades are picked up in starfish and a low grade might give rise to um, a flag that's, that's automatic based on certain criteria that are specified, say grade below 70. And so people might be in action trying to fix up a problem, an issue, reaching out to the student when the student might actually be doing quite well um, with regards to a weighted uh, grade book. Secondly, um, a reason for an appeal from a student is that the student doesn't know what their grade is in a class. And so if we don't use the weighted grade book in accordance with the weights specified in the course syllabus, then that's a um, grounds for an appeal. And so um, having that buttoned up um, benefits the students so that they know exactly where they stand in your class at all times. Exactly. And uh, that, that goes into the next discussion with reference to attendance and the reason why your attendance in your grade book need to be spot on because that attendance also feeds into starfish as well. But in the online environment, when we take attendance, that attendance should be more than just a student coming in and viewing content within their Moodle shell. We're looking for that student to have some type of tangible, that's required to have some type of tangible action, meaning that they need to do something other than just view your course shell. So we kind of established that for at least in week one, in every one of our online classes, you're going to do a Wednesday attendance. And uh, it doesn't, uh, we're kind of working our way through this now to try to develop some online criteria and expectations to further enhance that because the university is embracing the online world as we're moving to the eight week format. But currently right now today, if you were to teach a course for us in the spring, then you, in an online environment, we would expect to see something like this for Wednesday in week one, which basically says that that student has got, for this assignment, the student has gone, they've read the syllabus, and they've engaged by asking you some type of question or making some type of comment by Wednesday. And the reason why we do Wednesday is that if a student has not logged into Moodle yet, that they, they've not done this, then it's a flag for us, for you, to reach back out to the advisor, reach back out to the department chair, reach back out to the student to see what are their intentions, to see if they're having issues so that we can kind of get that corrected, you know, that keyword of retention. And in some cases, the student may sign up, pay their money, then get to the Moodle shell and things occur and they just back away from it. And, and we kind of want to turn that off before it gets to that point. And in some cases, the decision's already made uh, and, and that's certainly their choice. Then it's a matter of getting the Moodle shell cleaned back up so that we don't have to see that person populate in the Moodle shell. But in, in your attendance, you want to make sure that you set up your attendance, which is accurate in that your attendance reflects uh, the student's progress and part of that progress is doing some type of tangible action in that week. That they need to be uh, doing something that you can go out and measure more so than just having a student tour toward the, the uh, course yet. Any questions? Uh, can I make a comment? Sure. Uh, probably most of you uh, have already gone through Moodle 101 and, 101 and uh, 201. I would certainly encourage you to, uh, uh, to go through these because some of the things that we're talking about plus some other things are uh, part of this uh, Moodle 101 and 201. As a matter of fact, 201 goes to the uh, grade book itself. And uh, it'll teach you things and show you things that you may not have known about Moodle. So I'd encourage you to, to go through that. It would make it a lot uh, easier to do that. And what uh, 
uh, Dr. Um, Ward was talking about was the fact that what he showed you was for category. You can also do it by item, uh, but I myself use the category because I find it a lot easier. The one that we don't, uh, those are the only two that we use, either the uh, uh, items or the category. We, we have like arts and sciences, especially the English department, that will use the natural, which is like a uh, hundred, a thousand points to make an A, 800 to make a B and so on. We don't use those at all. We don't get involved in those at all. Only uh, weighted per item or weighted per category. And uh, for some of you who may have been you to um, what Dr. Hill was saying, these two advanced courses or these two courses, Moodle 201, 201, this, is, uh, this has been updated to the new 3.5 version. Uh, I want to remember we were using version 3.2 where some of you uh, may have been familiar with version 3.2. We're using a new version now. So reviewing this, if you're unfamiliar with some of the changes in Moodle or never used Moodle before, would be a, a good, worthy endeavor for you. A, a few more things from a policy standpoint. Um, you may get involved into a, a student will say, hey, I, I need to have an incomplete. Uh, I, I just cannot get through this course. And it's certainly well within your purview to grant a incomplete, but what I would encourage you to do is to engage the department chair, engage, uh, I, I'm signed into Moodle, and I want to go to uh, academics, registrar, and frequently requested forms is where you want to find Okay, let me sign in up here. I'm sorry, I thought I was signed in. There it was, now I'm signed in. If I'm signed in to Moodle, then it takes me to the intranet. And in the intranet, I can go to academics, to the registrar's office, then frequently requested forms. And in this frequently requested forms, I can find uh, some of these common forms that we use, one of those being a petition for incomplete. Petition for incomplete is not, should not be granted a student who is failing the course and they need to fail the course and they're trying to get an incomplete to keep from failing the course. If they're failing, um, well, if they're failing, then hopefully you have engaged with that student way before they got to that point and that uh, this is because something has came up that had a significant impact in that student's life that we need to make some reasonable accommodation to. Uh, it could be that uh, the student, um, you know, the sickness in the family, they had to respond to it and they just can't get it in and they, they need an additional time. Should not be used for a student who's just not, who's not turning in their work have not turned in their work and they're just trying to use this as a way to keep them safe. Because in the, um, in the incomplete, and we use the same incomplete for the graduate as well as the undergraduate, that they gotta have that. I mean, they, they've got to have demonstrated that they have been engaged, that they got the bulk of the work completed. And typically in a lot of our courses, you won't see that until the latter end of the course, not at the beginning. But we do recognize that a student may have some difficulties, challenges may come up, and they may want to request the incomplete. And what I recommend, what we all recommend, is if you get to that discussion with a student, then, then engage their academic advisor. Engage uh, the dean of the, uh, the uh, graduate school if you need to. Uh, Dr. Paul Swick is our uh, TSB academic advisor for, for the graduate program. Dr. David Dahmer is our Dean of the Graduate Program. You certainly have the uh, applicable department chairs. You have myself as well as Dean Best. But, but engage us, because what I like to know is what's going on with the student? Well, why do you need this? What's the issue? Because I'm looking at it holistically. I want to know 
Okay, if we grant an incomplete year and it drives into the next semester, what's your next semester course load? Is it reasonable to think that I could catch up this incomplete while at the same time I'm trying to catch up and maintain my other coursework? Or it could be that this course is a prerequisite to another course. And then I want to look at what is their, what has been their academic performance to date? And in some cases, engaging the, the academic advisor and turning to all these uh, things that we have discussed, we, we may come to a conclusion that, you know, it, it is easier for you, you as a student to take a semester off to clear up your issue than to continue to struggle for the next couple of semesters. Because it's going to impact financial aid potentially, it's going to impact VA benefits, I mean, and, and there's just a lot of downstream impact to it. So if you have to grant an incomplete, engage everyone. Let's let's see if it's going to be in the best long-term interest. And then let's say you said, okay, we, we agree an incomplete is complete. I think you have 45 days from the time that the incomplete is granted until the student has the opportunity to get their work in. Once they get their work in and you have graded that work and you're satisfied they have met that criteria, you have to go grab a change of grade form. That change of grade form, you fill it out and uh, it's sent to the physical department chair for that particular course and they review it and they, they will agree. Um, and then that they will administratively push that over to the uh, registrar's office to get that grade change. If that student does not respond and simply does not do their work, then at the end of that duration, that grade will automatically turn to an F. So you'll find those forms here under, again, the intranet, academic, under the registrar, under frequently requested forms, if you get to that point. Dr. Ward, this is uh, Peggy Wright again. I had last summer, it was a really unusual student, uh, uh, circumstance with a student, and I went the channels like you talked to about, but I could not get this form myself as an adjunct. Uh, I had, uh, I think Dr. Quick, Paul Quick, ended up sending it to me uh, so that I could fill it out, but I was not able to go through this as an adjunct and get it. I don't know if that was has been changed since then or not. I hope I don't run into another situation, but he was in a foreign country with a really unusual situation. And, and I don't know what level of access that uh, adjunct has as far as how deep they can dive into the intranet. Uh, but in either case, uh, I would reach out to the department chair. That department chair is listed on this course syllabi and get them engaged and they, they can get you the same form as well. I did, and that's that's how I got it, and we were able to work through it. So, Very good. but but I did. I just did want you to know. I'm not sure all adjuncts can get that, and yeah. you may have to go through the department chair, or like I did with Dr. Quick to, to follow through. Well, good, good, good feedback. Thank you so much. Uh, when you're following your course syllabi, uh, it's it's uh, your autonomy to make sure that. The uh, course is following the course syllabi. If you have to make a change, again, some what we talked about, engage the department chair. Now, you, you have the option. A lot, every one of our syllabi says no late work will be accepted, no curbing of grades, none of this, none of that. Um, and, and I will counsel, I will uh, couch it like this. Um, my starting point is I'm going to do what the syllabi instructs me to do but I'm going to engage the student before I make a final decision. I want to engage the student to understand what is going on. Because again, uh, if the student is struggling in this class, my class, do they have another class that they're struggling in that I need to expand my circle to get more people involved? And uh, I've had, like you've had, I've had students who had some, some catastrophic issues come up that uh, they they just could not get it in. Um, you know, we just had a recent uh, back in uh, October hurricane where we had students and faculty who got flooded out of their homes. Certainly, well within uh, you know, that was completely beyond their control, and I don't think a student was um, 
punished uh, or failed a course because of that significant catastrophic act of nature um, because of what the course syllabi said. So in, engage your students. Don't, don't just, I, I hate to use the word, but I'll use it for lack of a better term. Don't blindly follow it without engaging. Now the outcome may still be the same. They still may fail the course, but it, it gets back to the point that you are holding them accountable, but you're doing it with compassion. You're engaging to see what's going on first before you make that final decision. Now this is what I do. When a student, if I have a deliverable that's due on Sunday night, when I wake up Monday morning, if I don't see that assignment, there's two actions I'm gonna take. My first action is I'm gonna send that student an email and say, I don't see this, wondering what's going on, what assistance do you need, et cetera, et cetera. The next thing I'm gonna do in that email is that I have entered a zero in your grade book for this assignment. Please contact me, let's have a discussion, and uh, I may make a different decision to go back and undo that zero. But if I don't put a zero in that grade book, then I'm creating a false sense of, of um, security for that student that, hey, my grade is here, I'm good. Even though I missed this assignment, my grade is still good. And it's amazing that when you enter a zero into a grade book and that grade does this, just how quick that phone will ring. Uh, so, but I'm granting them the opportunity to contact me to explain, provide me with a plausible rationale. And I'll tell you for me, a student who says, I just forgot, uh, poor time management skills. Um, my, my job prevented me from, from doing that. It's the price of admission for being in an accelerated online program. But it takes on a different perspective if uh, you tell me that hey, I had a death in the family or I had a sickness in the family or Moodle crashed on me and I'm sitting here online. I was online the other day. I was having trouble with Moodle. So I know Moodle was not Moodling well. And when I see those type of comments, then I, I, my decision may be a little bit different. But poor time management skills or the dog ate my homework, I, I'm sorry, that, that's, that's just the way it is. The other thing I wanna talk about that I'll be done is uh, with reference to, we, we kind of talked about everything here that we're interested in. But let me talk about the Moodle shell, kind of the last thing. Uh, we, every one of the department chairs will, when you are assigned a course and you get that course filled out, we're gonna go in and we're gonna look at that course shell. We're gonna see that that course shell is built out. It has the content that kind of mirrors the, uh, what's in the course shell. We're gonna look at your grade book. We're gonna look at attendance. We're gonna look at the entire thing. We're gonna provide you feedback, good, bad, or different of what we saw. And what we're doing is we want to do that to ensure that our students are getting the content that we say that they're going to get over their course. Some of the things that we would like to see, and, and, and this is a little bit different, this is my seated class, but uh, the concepts are the same, that what we would like to see you do is to put an introduction in, tell them who you are, when you're going to meet, how are you going to be available? What's the course for online? Those type of things. And also, we, we certainly don't expect you to uh, have a uh, be sitting at the computer uh, from here from 8:30 to 11 o'clock, or sitting by your phone waiting for the phone to ring. That's that's not the intent in the virtual world. But to be able to communicate with that student that you know. During this time, I am going to make myself available. That availability may be an email, it may be via phone call, or it may be via a video conference, just like we're doing today. But let the student know when you're going to be available. Even if it's, um, like I say here, uh, you know, the best way to catch me is going to be on my cell phone. That, that's the best way to catch me, because I, I am all over the place but give them something where they can get in contact with you. Add your bio, make sure you have the current syllabi. Any, uh, this is just a lot more information that I add. 
certainly on the student accessibility information that if you need an accommodation, how you go about getting that. Any specific instructions I want them to know. Uh, if they're having technological issues, I can't fix Moodle, neither can you. Uh, but what they want to do is I want to make sure they have the contact numbers, that they can go get that and get their support needed. Uh, what I do tell them is that, hey, if you're having a Moodle, Moodle issue or, or you're something like that, I, I'm not going to be the first person you're going to contact, but I should be number two so that you're granting me the opportunity to make a different decision other than waking up the next day and seeing the assignment that's, that's not there. Um, and you have my, my cell phone number, so I'm pretty confident that 100% of our students know how to text. So do something. Don't, don't just sit there, student, and not get in contact with me. Uh, now, I use a collapse format. This is kind of like the format we use in the MBA that I kind of adopted over in my traditional classes and my non-traditional seated and online. You don't have to do that, but your Moodle shell is going to become available seven days before your course starts. So if you are assigned a course that starts on January the 14th, then on January the 7th, that Moodle shell is going to be accessible to your students. And if it's not built out, if there's nothing in that course shell that those students go look at, then they're probably going to be sending the email wanting to know what's going on. So I, I, I suggest one of two things, build it out as soon as you get your contract and get your course shell ready or hiding it administratively where it's not visible to the students until you get it built out. Because if we, typically what we will do, if you are brand new, and you get assigned a course, we will find a similar course and request the import of the content, if it's the same content other than the syllabi. And uh, your dates and some of that stuff will be all over the map and you have to fix it, but at least it gives you a starting point. Or if you're using a previous course that you are importing from, whatever's in that old course is going to be imported to the new course, and those dates are going to be wrong. And that's the reason why you want to kind of clean it up before the students have access to it or you're building it out before uh, they get access to it. Uh, you have the option up here under the course administration under this wheel to um, under more, uh, turn the editing on allows you to edit anything within the Moodle page under more. If I go to edit settings under course administrations and uh, I'm in that seventh day in my Moodle shell, I'm not through building it out and it's visible to the students, I can come here on the course available visibility and turn that to hide and the students can't see any of the content until I get it built out. Or if I'm in the middle of it, I may build out the first two weeks, shoot them an email saying, and uh, that, hey, I, I, this, I'm so-and-so, I'm working on the course shell, and I will let you know when it's completely built out. But up to this point, this is what you have to do in the first week. And the reason why I say that is because sometimes, sometimes uh, the contracts come out late, and we may not get it to you in, a, in, a, in the fast enough fashion that we're within that seven-day window before the course starts. And you, you, you and I and the both department chairs are, or scrambling to try to get that done to get you ready to go. Does any any one of the other department chairs have anything you want to say with reference to policy? Maybe a uh, comment about the request for an incomplete. Uh, you do have up to seven weeks, but that doesn't mean that you have to use all seven weeks. If the student can finish in two weeks, that would be even better because it seems like the longer time you give them, the more apt they are to miss that deadline and it turns to an app. So don't give them excessive time because uh, they'll take it. And uh, if they had two weeks instead, they'd be working on it and get it, get it finished. So you don't, it can be anything up to seven weeks. And Dave, that, that's a great point. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hill. And I've got to add this that, um, at the, at the last day of your class, which is typically on Sunday, uh, you have up to four days 
sooner rather than later, but up to four days to get your grades in. Uh, upload your grades into Moodle. And once you upload your grades into Moodle, it's a one and done type of scenario, which means that here I am in Grade Reporter. Can you see my screen? Okay, so here I am in Grade Reporter and I am going to do a final grade entry. And it's going to list out what the course total is and it has me this drop down menu and I can do whatever A's and B's that I want. For the MBA classes, for the MBA classes only, uh, we don't give D's. You either make a C or higher or you fail the course. We do not give D's in the MBA classes. But I enter in the grades that I want, I validate it. Then when I hit this thing called save final grades, once I do that, I cannot go back and change that grade. This is a one and done. So you want to make sure when you get ready to submit those grades that you are completely satisfied and that it's accurate. Because once you hit save grades, you cannot go back and change it. And the only way that we can change that grade would be through a change of grade form. And in that submitting of grades, that change of grade form, you can get that as well from the registrar's office or contact your department chair to get that. Typically, um, if your Moodle shell is going to be accessible to you and to students two weeks after the last class day or that Sunday, two weeks thereafter. So Dr. Hill was indicating that you can do it incomplete up to seven weeks, but you can certainly do it earlier. So let's say that I'm doing a turning in assignment. I've submitted my grades. I've given Doug a incomplete Doug gets his assignment in before the two weeks lapse after the last Sunday of that particular course session. He uploads it into Moodle. I'm uploading it into Turnitin. You do your grading in Turnitin. You provide the student feedback. You still have to submit the change of grade form, even if you do that, simply for the reason that once you hit the save final grades, it's done. The Moodle shell is no longer accessible to the student to do anything with it or for you to make any changes or setting of assignments after those two weeks. All right, uh, we talked about a lot. Kind of want to open it up to see what type of questions that, that uh, any of you have or that we didn't address. Dr. Ward, just going back to um, the example that you gave about um, online classes and a student's attendance in the first week and then contacting the student's advisors if uh, I don't see the activity by Wednesday, um, how, uh, what's the best way to go about uh, contacting the advisor? Is it through the Starfish program, uh, putting a flag for that student or going through the department chair and then uh, finding out the advisor's email and contacting them through that channel? Yes to all of that. Okay. All I, right. I, yeah, I, I say that, um, okay, to, to uh, turn over every stone you need to turn over, but because in an accelerated program, um, you know, e even though eight weeks sounds like a lot, even, but five weeks is even, even worse, that trying to get the student back on the conveyor belt, it, sooner rather than later, just pays great dividends. So I, I will, I, I'll turn over whatever lock I need to turn over and contact who I need to contact. But I typically will start with their advisor and the student first. That's typically where I will start and see what it goes from there. All right, great, thanks. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Anyone else have a question or comment of what we've covered or anything else we didn't cover that you would like to have covered? Okay, one last thing for me before we turn back over to Dr. Best. Uh, as we indicated, we are going through a transition. We are moving uh, in the summer to the eight-week format. We don't know exactly 
how many courses that we're going to have available or who will be assigned those courses yet. You may have been you may have been with us for a while and had the great opportunity to get two or three courses over a, a, a semester. As we go through this transition, I would request that you be patient with us as we get through it. Let's get on the backside and see exactly uh, how everything shakes out. I think all of us is kind of under the impression that, that there may be a little dip in the offerings until we kind of get things sorted back out and get back to an equilibrium point. So request that you be patient. If for some reason that we don't reach out and offer you something, and if you have a question, uh, please let us know. Uh, because you know, with, uh, with the changes that we're doing, a lot of you are strictly in the online world for us, and, and we still need that influence in the online world. But I just don't know, none of us know for sure exactly how many and what type of courses that we're going to be able to offer. In fact, we're, we're still uh, getting through the fall, finally finalizing the spring so that we can get ready for the summer. So please uh, be patient. Uh, Dr. Best. Hey. <clears throat> um, I had to get up for a minute. Now my eyes were just about to close <coughs> earlier. Um, thanks again for being here. Um, like I mentioned this morning, um, if you teach for other schools and you see um, anything, resources, methods, material that you think that we would could improve our programming, then uh, let somebody know, let one of us know so that we can integrate it into our courses or Play, put a budget request in for uh, additional resources. We want to be the best we can be and um, have the best quality programs that we can. So uh, don't hesitate to share with us any uh, information you get uh, through teaching at other schools. Also, if you run into, if you have friends or uh, associates, um, that would be good adjuncts for us. Um, of course, not to compete with you in your area, but um, across the board, you know, we offer programs in accounting, healthcare, HR, CIS, computer information systems, general business management, finance. We got a new finance program coming on board um, now, currently. Um, this semester, the finance classes are, are up for the first time. Um, we also have an analytics certificate that will be coming online for classes uh, in an analytics that are, uh, we partner with SAS to um, provide a certificate. Um, so analytics is probably a, a new area that you're, you're probably unfamiliar with. It's, in the past, it's been traditional. Um, the faculty will be voting, no, we just voted yesterday on the business analytics certificate. Um, so watch for information about that. Again, the finance, our new finance program. And then we have some non-traditional ideas that will be coming out. Um, no new courses really, just new different, different packaging. So. Hopefully there won't be any change in demand for business adjuncts. Uh, we definitely need more qualified adjuncts in every area. So if you have associates, friends, qualified in specific areas, um, masters is minimum, um, doctorate is preferred. Um, if it's someone that is a working professional we would have, be really good at teaching, then uh, we're very interested. We want, as adjuncts, we want people that are practicing um, in the field as much as possible. So, um, our, 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 we're just deep into um, self-study right now, accreditation. So, hopefully, we'll be winding that up as the new year, as the new year starts. But. Right now, we're very deep. Do you have any questions um, pertaining to anything that you've heard? 
I would encourage you, if you someone's called you about a class, to reach out. If you don't hear within a week um, confirmation on the class, um, if a department chair calls you and you don't get notified, you look on self-service, that, then naturally, the natural process is for someone to reach out and call you, and then if you're in the system already and has been credentialed, have been credentialed, you should see your name go up in self-service um, as staff. So um, you don't have to, Doug, do you know, does the contract, the contract doesn't have to be signed as I understand it. I mean, your name can show in the system before the contract is signed. Uh, it, it, it was my understanding that we reach out to the uh, individual, they agree then we submit the uh, request. Or, yes. Then, then it gets approved. Then uh, Ms. Ashley Gales over in the Vice President of Academic Affairs would reach out to that individual with the contract. Yes, but I think the contracts don't go out prior to 30 days. Uh, I might be able to help you with that, Dr. Best. I just, uh, I was notified mm, probably a month ago about asking to teach a course that starts Monday in the MBA, the accounting. And I agreed and I monitored the uh, enrollment and it was kind of low and I told him it was fine to drop it. I just want to be able to help y'all uh, right. when I have time. But I just got the contract uh, one day this past week sent to me from Ashley Gale. So that's kind of the way it's happened with me is, uh, and this is the fourth one I've talked for y'all. So usually I'm asked to do it. And then uh, as the course fills in, then I usually get the contract and I just have to email back saying that, I accept the contract. I see. But I was just wondering, like, because we've got so we've got courses in session C staffed, so to some degree, not all the classes, and the instructors' names go up. But I, I don't think that the contracts go out thirty days before thirty days prior to the class beginning. I and think it's a month ahead of time. And Dr. Rumble, hopefully you have received yours and you are ready to go for your econ class as well. Uh, I don't have a contract. No contract yet? No, I haven't seen anything. I don't have a, by email, I haven't seen anything. Yeah, we definitely, how about, how about the, we don't, we don't have that documentation in, in, in our offices. So, but we can help you get those contracts if you, um, when you, right before, like right now, before your a class is about to start, you should have a contract in hand. So I we, don't think mine came until like Monday, geez, our semester started Wednesday, but it's been a little bit. Is that mine? Ooh, that was nice. I, I don't think I got mine until like, um, it was Monday, Tuesday, maybe, uh, this past week, that I got an email for the contract and the class starts Monday. So it was definitely not 30 days out. I was fine with that. That was not a problem. Right. That's helpful to know. Dr. Rundle, you, you did get access to the uh, Moodle show? Yes. Okay. I, I will run the contract down. I will shoot Miss Ashley and Dr. Dahmer an email at the conclusion of this meeting today. See if we can't get that expedited. Okay. Thank you for your patience. And one other note, um, so Dr. Poole is uh, promising increases in adjunct pay for both undergraduate and graduate classes. When, so we, go to, yeah, when we go to the eight week format. Mm -hmm. With the eight week format. Anything else relevant that you know of? Thanks for taking your time to meet with us. Thanks everyone, glad you were here. If you have any questions, please reach out to your department chair or myself, we'll be glad to provide whatever assistance is necessary. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thanks to you.